uh, the seminar. So first of all, I'm, I'm very glad uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Ram Mohan Sri Ramdas, so in short Ram, is able to take the time uh, to give a presentation today. Uh, Ram is very, very exciting researcher in the area of energy harvesting. I've been watching uh, his work for last seven or eight years now. Uh, while he was doing his doctorate studies at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and was working at one of the one of the largest center in India on MEMS devices, and probably one of the best clean room facilities uh, in the country. And and so he he developed a really good uh, electromechanical modeling of various kinds of energy harvesting devices and propose some really good theory on how to characterize and quantify the behavior of harvesters under different kinds of excitations. And at uh, Virginia Tech, uh, he continued on uh, this energy harvesting work addressing uh, thermal energy harvesting, with different kinds of mechanism, vibrations and magnetic fields. And at Penn State, he has actually taken a much broader role and has done really good work in, in addition to energy harvesting in the area of robotics and thermoacoustics. So it's really a very diversified researcher with lots of skills and talent and, and a really great educator. Uh, interacts with students and postdocs, trains them uh, very nicely. So I'm very, very impressed with the quality of his research and the quality of training and education that Trump provides. I think all of you will, will very much benefit from his presentation and also feel free to interact with Ram um, and ask questions because I think this is a great chance for you to learn from the basics of energy harvesting. Uh, so, so if you don't understand anything or this is a new for some, some folks on the call because there are a lot of students on the call, uh, then please ask Ram. I think this is a good chance for you to ex explore uh, different kinds of fundamental science in this area. So with that, I will pass it on to you, Ram, and thank you so much for giving the talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Priya. And uh, I hope the slides are visible. If you can see the first. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Priya, for the introduction. And uh, I'm also thankful uh, to PAC Fellowships for uh, providing me with an opportunity to uh, give the seminar. Uh, uh, my main uh, topic as uh, it reads is uh, energy harvesting and I will mainly be focusing myself on vibrations and magnetic fields in this uh, talk. Uh, so to start off, I will briefly introduce uh, 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 motivation as to why exactly we would look into this piezoelectric uh, research and um, uh, how do we transfer the energy to these harvesters because like usually these vibration energy harvesters or something like we need to look for a source and then we transfer the energy from the source to these harvesters and as a next next step these harvesters themselves have to be uh, very efficient so how do we design uh, piezoelectric harvesters effectively so that they can transfer transduce the energy from mechanical domain to the electrical domain and uh, there is a, a neat technique called scaling analysis that I will discuss over to enhance the performance of these harvesters, mainly to know what the parameter is causing the power to go high is what uh, we can very easily get out of that. And towards the end, I will discuss uh, uh, hybrid energy harvesters and magnetic field energy harvesters, wherein uh, there are multiple domains in them and uh, by multiple mechanisms basically. And towards the end, I uh, will have a discussion on the outlook. So when, uh, when one looks at uh, the piezoelectric harvesting research, uh, you would see that uh, the Google patents say that there, are, uh, there is a continuous uh, rise in the patents and even there are several companies which have been uh, uh, getting the patents on uh, particularly the piezoelectric harvesting. Although it has been told that the energy harvesting is only about 3% of the market uh, value for the piezoelectrics, but uh, eventually it appears to grow higher and higher, say in 10 years from now, uh, almost 650 
million dollars and even by saying 20 years from now there has been a prediction of at least 3.9 billion dollars market value but simultaneously when when we look at uh, the way the installations occur particularly in terms of uh, say the trillion sensor vision that many companies have for example um, as you see here like as the number of sensors grow more and more, there is a need to power these sensors higher and higher. And if you look at, uh, uh, say, 20 years down the line, there are almost five times uh, increase uh, in the overall market for these sensors. And there is a very interesting study that is conducted particularly on the IoTs and uh, the way the IoTs get power out. Uh, it shows that uh, future IoTs uh, Suppose, for example, if, if an IoT has to be designed to transmit the data, say, of one megabytes every, every minute over 100 uh, meters of distance, it has been uh, predicted that uh, uh, in future, it's mostly the capacitor uh, where the volume shrinkage is going to happen. And simultaneously, the overall uh, volume of the unit or the IoT unit is going to shrink. And uh, it has been predicted in some of the references that uh, the future wireless IoT devices uh, would uh, predominantly use uh, energy harvesting over uh, batteries and uh, partly even the, uh, the short term storage like uh, ceramic capacitors as the primary source. And uh, this, in fact, motivates us to kind of uh, pursue um, how, to en how to enhance the performance of these harvesters so that they are suitable and we'll be able to implement these directly to the future needs of the sensors is what is the uh, main motivation here. As such, energy harvesting uh, uh, will be able to scavenge energy from different uh, sources. For example, if it is light, uh, if it is wind, so there are different technologies using which we can uh, extract the energy. Uh, for example, photovoltaics are the means to absorb the light and uh, wind turbines for the wind and thermoelectric modules are uh, the ones to absorb heat. Uh, I would uh, mainly be concentrating in this talk uh, on the vibrations and the magnetic fields. So here in vibrations, again, there are different means of uh, harvesting, like we could have electrodynamic method, um, or a piezoelectric uh, method, but I would uh, start off with uh, mainly vibrations uh, in using piezoelectric harvesting. Before that, uh, first we need to know how do we transfer the energy from vibration source? So are these vibrations always unde undesirable? Perhaps like one would start off asking this question. Uh, well, most of the time, yes, we have uh, these vibrations which are undesirable, say vehicular vibrations or mainly the industry, uh, uh, equipment which is installed has the surfaces vibrating and we are mainly concentrating on that and not the uh, good ones like well by that I mean there are vibrations needed in instruments and speakers these are essential for us but we are mainly interested in the vibrations which are not desirable so particularly uh, the ones found in industry industrial setup like for example if you have a uh, joint flywheel housing or uh, blower surfaces. These are the ones where vibrations are more and even uh, vehicle surfaces are also uh, uh, sources for vibration. But this again depends on mostly on the road conditions. But nevertheless, uh, if we want to transfer these vibrations, um, there are a few ways in which we can mitigate them. For example, uh, rotating machinery basically have uh, these vibrations because of the unbalance within the system. So partly by balancing out the unbalance, we'll be able to uh, reduce the vibrations or even uh, by maintaining close assembly tolerances we can, but uh, it so happens that uh, it's not always feasible or rather it becomes very expensive if you want to maintain close tolerances and uh, hence the overall cost increases. So we have to look out for alternative ways to suppress these vibrations. And uh, for our rescue, uh, we have this well-known concept of tuned mass damper, which is what is uh, uh, shown here. So this uh, is a absorber on the right-hand side. You see that this vibration absorber is going to 
absorb the energy which the primary structure has and uh, suppresses the primary structure vibrations and absorbs it into the um, absorber. Basically, in our case, uh, even the harvester is exactly the same thing. So the harvester is more like a vibration absorber and it is going to uh, take the energy which the primary structure originally has and then transduce part of it into electrical output, in the, which is in a usable form. So, uh, well, uh, certainly this harvester acts as an absorber, but um, how do we design this uh, harvester? By that, I mean, what has to be the overall mass of the harvester and what has to be, to be the frequency at which this has to operate given uh, a vibration source? So this can be a quick question as to answer uh, how to design this. So we have several of these harvesters mounted on, for example, on this panel. How do we design that? So to answer this, uh, first we go into the uh, characteristics of the plate. So the vibrating structure does uh, have some signature on it. So based on that, we kind of know the existing uh, quantities like the equivalent mass stiffness of the source. And uh, the task left at hand is to design this harvesters, like what has to be the equivalent mass of the harvester. What is the stiffness? Indirectly, the stiffness uh, is something which is which can be represented in the form of frequency. So, the, what has to be the frequency at which the harvester should operate for a given source, and uh, what has to be the harvester damping to be desired? So, these three parameters are the ones which we are interested in, and uh, these very three uh, things are represented in slightly different manner, like the mass ratio, MR, and uh, frequency ratio alpha and the so these three are the values of our interest. And to determine these, we first uh, understand how does the system behave. So for example, if we have uh, several harvesters mounted on a vibration source, uh, there are uh, dominantly only two modes. So in the first mode, all the, all the masses go in phase with the harvester. And in the second mode, all the harvesters go out of phase with the primary mass. So these two modes are essentially the frequencies at which we'll be able to absorb the energy from the primary source. So, and uh, having, this, uh, having said this, we want to know what are the frequencies at which these two occur. And uh, we can very easily uh, est estimate them by doing an eigen analysis. And uh, the difference of these two eigenfrequencies gives us uh, the bandwidth. And based on the bandwidth that we chose, uh, we are actually restricted on the mass ratio that can be put. So there is an upper limit on the mass ratio and uh, we use this particular value and uh, fix one number and we are left with only alpha and zeta one to be determined. And these two are determined uh, in an iterative manner. So we, what we do is that we estimate the energies in this system. So the energies here are uh, the input energy. So the overall energy that is going into this entire system is what is first uh, given as a condition. And uh, the second condition, what is the amount of energy absorbed by the harvesters? So these two are the two conditions and we kind of satisfy them iteratively and uh, get the alpha and zeta one. So as an example, we just take certain values of uh, mass ratio and uh, frequency. And then here you can see on the bottom plot that uh, the energy absorbed is going to be equal at both the resonant frequencies and uh, simultaneously at a particular value, we have wide bandwidth. And uh, not only this, but uh, on the left-hand side bottom picture, you will see that uh, uh, what the result of all this analysis is that we were able to capture the entire energy which the primary structure has. Originally, the primary structure has a lot of energy, but by doing this analysis, uh, by using this alpha and zeta, we made sure that the entire energy that is present in the system is now transferred to the harvesters and all the input is only with the absorbers now, which is actually the harvester. So uh, having done this uh, effort, we now know what is the frequency ratio and the damping that we have to design the harvester to match uh, the source so that we can absorb the entire energy in the source. So now we go forward and try to design the piezoelectric energy harvester. So the piezoelectric energy harvesters have, uh, uh, here we make use of the piezoelectric material when uh, 
the, when this material is subjected to stress, electric charge is generated. And uh, these are the typical constitutive relations wherein the coupling occurs through the piezoelectric stress quotient, without which uh, you know that these are very well known stress strain relations. Uh, but these coupling coefficients are the ones which are going to uh, modify the dynamics of the electromechanical system here. So here, for example, I'm sorry, uh, here we have a piezoelectric bimorph on the right-hand side. So this is a typical structure which, uh, which is used to harvest the energy. So there are bimorph, basically it has got two piezoelectric layers, one on top and the other on the bottom. Uh, all we are interested in is uh, to get the displacement and displacement of this beam and what is the voltage that uh, this uh, bimorph develops. So uh, this piezoelectric uh, bimorph is very well known and also uh, because there are two layers, one pos there are two possibilities to, to combine these two layers. One is either uh, combine the layers in series or combine the layers in parallel. And uh, these governing equations are very well established and um, the only Thing, key thing that you see is the coupling coefficient. So this G is what is going to couple the mechanical and the electrical domain. So without this G, you will notice that the equation is merely an oscillatory equation. So it is a second order differential equation. And without uh, this G uh, here, it is the mere result of uh, Kirchhoff's laws. And uh, this G is what is coupling. And uh, we know that uh, uh, the bimorphs uh, are good, particularly when we compare, when we make them in the form of parallel configurations. So here, uh, uh, the material used uh, is PVDF by the time in there are weakly coupled harvesters. And uh, in, such, in these harvesters, parallel combination has been shown to give higher power. So one would perhaps ask, uh, is this the only way to enhance the power output from the harvesters? Uh, perhaps uh, can we have several of these harvesters mounted side by side and get the output? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the thing is, uh, uh, it certainly improves, uh, for example, the power output is going to be maximum uh, or keeps, keeps increasing as we keep on adding the harvesters. But unfortunately, uh, the resonance frequencies of the two beams are going to be uh, different or rather it's going to be very difficult to very closely match the resonance frequencies of two harvesters which are side by side and um, to answer this uh, problem we have uh, thought of an alternative technique wherein uh, we make use of several layers of course here but uh, they all are going to resonate at resonate simultaneously. So in this configuration where there is a multi-layered uh, harvester, we have several of these layers on the structure, but all of them are going to resonate at the, at the structural resonance. And uh, here we have uh, very similarly combined uh, different layers together in parallel, just as we found that the parallel combination was resulting in higher output. Uh, but of course, one thing that we might want to take care of is the neutral layer uh, height. Uh, definitely, uh, this will lie on, within the substrate if we have equal number of layers on both sides of the substrate. So we are all good. Uh, but unlike uh, bimorph, it's going to be a little difficult for us to solve, get the dif differential equations for this uh, multi-layer because there are several layers and we have to keep track of the polarization in every layer. To, to solve this, uh, we have uh, made use of Hamilton's principle. The extended Hamilton's principle basically takes care of uh, even the work of non-conservative forces. And by using this and different energies in the system, we arrive at the differential equations governing the behavior of uh, this multi-layered harvester. And here again, we made use of uh, shape functions within the segment. So there are two segments and uh, we separate them out uh, by assuming certain shape functions within the segment and trying to match different boundary conditions at the interface. But by doing all these uh, algebraic steps, like we end up with the governing equations as shown. And if you look at these equations are exactly identical to what we had previously, 
uh, with an exception that the coefficients now are represented in terms of the integrals here because we have kind of assumed the shape functions. And uh, one very uh, interesting thing and uh, uh, key aspect of this Hamiltonian's uh, this Hamilton's principle is that uh, uh, the boundary conditions are a direct result of the steps that we take to arrive at the governing equations. So I like very much about this that uh, we don't have to take uh, pay much attention to the directions of the bending moment and uh, uh, slope continuity because these are all directly followed as a result of uh, the Hamilton's principle. Um, so having understood so much, but one would uh, really uh, be interested about this coupling coefficient g. So how does this coupling coefficient change with multilayer, whether it really increases or not? So this is partly explained by this equation wherein, it, wherein the multilayered uh, harvester has got this behavior. And because we have a multilayered uh, configuration, we can directly derive this uh, bimorph and unimorph as a special case for this. So we simply reduce the number of layers to two and one and arrive at these uh, relations. And uh, one can see that uh, the multilayer coupling coefficient is higher when compared with either bimorph or unimorph uh, using these uh, geometric parameters. And uh, further, in order to validate this uh, uh, method, uh, we went ahead and tried to perform experiments to find out the increase in the power levels. So here, the multilayered harvester uh, uh, as you can see, is compared with the bimorph harvesters. Uh, the power power density, of course, it's a little less, but uh, certainly when we introduce multi-layers, the power density is higher than the bimorphs. And uh, this is, in fact, going to work even with uh, strongly coupled harvesters making use of PZT as the material. Here, only PBDF is used. Uh, well, after having these results uh, at hand, one would also ask whether are there still any other methods to increase the power further? Uh, well, perhaps, uh, yes, uh, what we have found is that uh, by with using the same volume of the piezoelectric material, but uh, distributing it on the beam, we can have a different structure for the harvester, which is in the form of multi-step. So the, as such, the material used, the piezoelectric volume of the, uh, used in both these harvesters is exactly identical. But the only thing is now uh, this very same harvester is, in, is having a distribution. The cross section keeps on changing. And this is what uh, is uh, showing up here. And we, what we want to do uh, here is uh, to describe the shape functions in each of these segments. Um, and it's going to be a little difficult because uh, earlier we had only two steps, but uh, here we have several steps. And uh, partly this is also uh, making the beam more compliant and hence it's going to uh, provide more power. And the strain distribution within each of the layers and the area of the piezoelectric layer are also favorably adding up to the power. But the only problem, as I mentioned, is that there are uh, different segments and uh, it's going to be a little difficult for us to kind of uh, satisfy the boundary conditions at each step. So to solve this, uh, we assume shape functions and uh, different shape functions in each of the segments will let us solve, solve for the coefficients by satisfying the boundary conditions at the respective interface. I'm not going to go in, into details, but uh, this shape functions uh, is useful to estimate the behavior of the harvester, both finally till the voltage and power levels. So here there is a quick comparison of these shape functions, as you can see, uh, when compared with the exact values, they are almost going one on top of the other. And um, in both cases, like this is a single step and this, is the, this has two steps and uh, you can see that there is a smooth transition from one segment to the other segment. And uh, it is supposed to predict the way the exact shape functions uh, do. And we have, in fact, found that uh, uh, this is indeed happening. And uh, this multi-stepped harvester was performing much better when compared with the multi-layered harvesters. 
and uh, for the same amount of input for both the harvesters. And uh, the key thing here, as I mentioned, is the volume of the material is exactly the same. So we want to uh, extract more power from the same volume of the piezoelectric material used. So this is another way in which we can uh, enhance the power output from these piezoelectric harvesters. And uh, to do a quick demonstration as to uh, how can we apply these uh, is that by kind of uh, mounting several of these harvesters on a vibrating source and uh, we kind of make use of a small circuit to kind of uh, rectify and regulate the output uh, so that a super capacitor can be charged. And then we channel the power to a smoke detector, which is off the shelf and uh, typically requires about 60 microwatts of power. And uh, we have demonstrated that this indeed does uh, uh, develop power as we wanted. But uh, one would perhaps ask whether, uh, is there any way to kind of, of course we have in fact derived the differential equations and try to design the harvester, but is there more to it as to how to change the parameters? For example, what happens if I keep increasing the length of the harvester? How does it change the power? Uh, how does uh, changing an end mass increase the power? So to do this, uh, there is something called uh, scaling analysis, which is what I was talking about, and I'm very fond of this. That is, uh, it's mainly an optimization way of uh, uh, getting the power output from such harvesters. So here, uh, if we are given a harvester, uh, all we want to do is uh, we want to extract the power uh, to the maximum extent. Unfortunately, it's uh, although it seems to be very uh, easy because the voltage uh, is what is finally the end result to calculate the power. But uh, unfortunately, this voltage is dependent on different parameters like the input or the coupling coefficient, the frequency, the capacitance. So all these parameters go into the expression for power. So we perhaps will be able to kind of uh, separate out the contributions, say, by distributing the expression here and there but so that is what uh, is the main thing here so the goal here is to kind of separate out the contribution of dimensions or the contribution of proof mass and then what we are doing at the end is uh, we are calling them as different factors like inertial factor or the power factor or the material factor so these factors are the final factors which when we focus on will be sufficient enough for us to say that this is yes the best possible harvester that we can uh, design. So to do that, I will not go into more of the mathematical details, but uh, I will just try to explain in simpler terms how this is done. So what we do is we just take this uh, expression for power and kind of replace it with uh, in a much shorter version by attributing, lumping all the variations into one particular factor. Like this is the non-dimensional number power, factor, which is again dependent on the coupling factor. So after separating this out, we first look at the power factor and try to see when is the power factor going to be maximum. So to get this, uh, what we do is we, definitely it is related to many parameters here. The frequency ratio, for example, it is more, it's a depic depictive of uh, the frequency at which we are operating. So definitely at the resonance frequency, the power is going to be maximum, but unfortunately that peak is going to shift with respect with the, with the low resistance ratio. So by adding low resistance to the harvester, we are shifting the peak. So this shift in the peak is what we are going to track and uh, get a closed loop expression. For example, if we want to look at uh, how this power factor changes, so this is how it occurs. As I was mentioning, there is definitely one peak, uh, one frequency at which the power output uh, is going to be maximum or rather the power factor is maximum. But this peak is going to shift as we change the load resistance. So we change the load resistance, the peak is going to move, ahead, move aside. And we want to keep these two as close as possible by solving this equation and try to get the maximum possible value of the power factor. So this is uh, uh, achieved by optimizing this power factor expression. And we arrive at a very neat uh, expression, which is uh, the relation between the coupling factor and the damping. 
So when we meet this particular condition, that means if we have, if we are able to design a harvester which satisfies this condition, that means the coupling factor of the harvester is uh, set such a way that the appropriate damping ratio can be uh, depicted by that, we, we get the maximum possible power factor for that. So this power factor further, it reduces down to a simple expression, which is 1 16 times zeta. And uh, as you can see here, even the variation K star is, uh, this particular expression tracks the uh, peaks uh, very well. And uh, interestingly enough, once we introduce this expression, the power output uh, boils down to the well-known forms of uh, the power expression, which are being derived in other literatures. So uh, having optimized this power factor, we are just left with other parameters in the system, like the, we have the force, we have uh, mass and frequency, but these have to be slightly modified uh, by normalizing with the acceleration. So we have the acceleration uh, which is inside the fort. So we separate that out because we want to compare the performance of different harvesters. So one person may be introducing more acceleration and we and show a higher power, but uh, by normalizing the acceleration squared, we are able to compare uh, rationally any different any two harvesters. So this is the motto to uh, normalize the acceleration. So once we have this, we'll be able to maximize uh, the remaining portion, which is the product of five different terms. So as I mentioned, SCIMP stand for scaling, composition, inertial, material, and power factor, which we just saw. So it is the remaining factors which uh, are going to govern the behavior of the power developed. For example, as uh, I will just show the expression for different composition, although they look complicated, I will just uh, very briefly explain. For example, the scaling factor is uh, nothing but B times L cube, which is the width times length cubed. So if we increase the length of the harvester, the power is going to go cubed. So the dependency is uh, L cubed. And if we increase the width linearly, the power is going to linearly scale. So this is a neat uh, expression that we were able to separate out to kind of uh, understand what changes will make the harvester uh, show higher power. Similarly, the composition inertial factor and even the material factor, for example, the material properties that we use directly go into this. So as an example, uh, quickly, if, if I look into the inertial factor, so this is depending only on the mass ratio and the frequency ratio. So uh, I'm sorry, ma mass ratio and the uh, mass movement of inertia uh, ratio. So this these two, uh, are going to govern the inertial factor, which are mainly the result of the mass that I use on the tip mass, as a tip mass. And then the composition factor is something which is dependent again on different materials that we choose. So there is a particular value of thickness uh, ratio that is the thickness of the piezoelectric versus the substrate at which the composition factor is going to be maximum. So each of these factors are going to be maximum for a particular uh, geometry. So as I mentioned, uh, by selecting set particular material, we have a particular value of the material factor and uh, scaling the dimensions or, or limiting the scaling factor, and the power factor, as I explained. So these all are the different factors. If we keep track of, we will be able to easily explain why a particular harvester develops more power. So this concept uh, is what uh, we call this as just skimp factors in the scaling analysis. So we employ this uh, concept on different uh, harvesters which are reported in the literature. And uh, one good thing about this is that it's not only applicable to a meso scale, but uh, we can also apply this on to a very small scale, the MEMS scale energy harvester. If we want to enhance the power from a MEMS harvester, what do, what do we do is a big question that one has to answer. So from this KIMP analysis, what we did is that we have uh, extracted several uh, harvesters which are reported in the literature and tried to compare what does this uh, predicted value. This predicted uh, normalized power is nothing but simply the product of five different factors that I mentioned, SCIMP and versus what uh, they have actually reported in that particular uh, literature. 
Uh, and we see that there is a reasonable match between what is predicted versus what uh, is reported in the respective literature. And uh, to, partly we will also be able to explain why that particular harvester had a very high power. For example, uh, if one looks at it, it is the inertial factor that uh, one of the harvesters was having way too higher when compared with the other factors. So, so this is a neat way of uh, delineating the contribution of each of the harvest, each of the parameters of a harvester so that we can make sure that the harvester that we designed is in fact uh, the best possible configuration, best possible configuration. So uh, th this is mostly about uh, the scaling analysis. And then from here, I will move on to the hybrid energy harvesting. Uh, here, uh, hybrid harvesting as the name itself suggests there are multiple domains within the system. So it can be electrodynamic, it can be piezoelectric energy harvesting, for example, uh, which we have already seen. Uh, electrodynamic uh, harvester, wherein it's mostly governed by the Faraday's law, wherein we have a conductor and uh, potential induced within the conductor due to the uh, movement in magnetic field is what is uh, um, possible to absorb the energy. So uh, a typical configuration of hybrid energy uh, harvester is that we combine these two together. So we have uh, both piezoelectric domain and also the electrodynamic domain. We, this particular uh, combination can be uh, easily represented in the form of an equivalent circuit. So in here, uh, on the left-hand side, it all describes the mechanical domain, wherein we have equivalent mass, stiffness, and damping. On the other hand, we have electrical domain, wherein here you can see that the blue box uh, mostly describes the piezoelectric uh, energy harvester, and the green box bottom descri describes the electrodynamic energy harvester. Here again, uh, uh, as we have done previously, we make use of the Hamilton's principle to arrive at the governing differential equations. Here, in addition to the displacement and voltage, uh, we have one more uh, variable, which is the current flowing through the conductor. And uh, we get the governing equations in this manner. We have one more additional term because of the electrodynamic coupling. Um, as I mentioned before, this equivalent circuit uh, representation uh, is more favorable for us uh, because we will be able to make use of this and directly estimate the optimum load resistance. So this was in fact uh, possible because of the two port elements. So this two port elements, we have a transformer which, uh, in which we have the relation between potential on one end to the potential on the other end. And the second one uh, is a gyrator wherein we have the relation between the potential on one end to the current on the other end. So this gyrator is what we have used here in the electromagnetic uh, harvester. And the transformer is the one which we used in the piezoelectric harvester. So one very good thing about representing the same equations of motion in this fashion is that we will be able to uh, use the Thevenin's theorem and extract the optimum loads in a much easier manner compared with solving these equations, it will become very complicated. So what we do here is that uh, we reduce these into lump uh, uh, impedances and try to estimate the optimal load uh, in the respective domain. So this is a, a very simple circuit uh, representation of uh, the optimum load in piezoelectric domain. And this is the one simple, this is mere algebra and one would be able to very easily transfer the impedances from one domain to the other and come back again from that domain to the domain of power interest. So this method was used in estimating these two. Uh, fortunately, it was very easy than solving the other equations at hand. And uh, again, like we would uh, also want to verify whether these are something that we really uh, expect or not. So to do this, uh, a hybrid harvester was fabricated. Uh, as you see here, it has piezoelectric domain and uh, on top and uh, electromagnetic uh, domain on the bottom with a coil and the magnet arrangement. And uh, here, uh, for example, the piezoelectric power, if you see, 
there is an optimum load uh, here, and this is in fact uh, given by the Thevenin's theorem. So the very same expression is what uh, would give us the optimum load in the piezoelectric domain. And similarly, uh, in the case of electrodynamic uh, domain, we have uh, the optimum power, or rather the peak power occurring exactly at the value predicted by the expression. Instead of uh, solving all the equations, we directly make use of this end result to get the peak power. And we have, in fact, verified uh, experimentally to kind of uh, see where exactly this peak power lies. And uh, it, in fact, was showing up where uh, we predicted using these equations. And uh, also, the peak power uh, is reasonably good in electrodynamic power up to about 1 milliwatt versus piezoelectric power, which is around 60 microwatts. So after looking at these values, perhaps one would say this harvester is more like an electrodynamic harvester, but not a piezoelectric harvester because the power is very small. And uh, what happens uh, in such a system, or can I make the piezoelectric power also go very high and uh, simultaneously enhance the power from the electrodynamic power uh, domain? Uh, and uh, one would also perhaps ask, when does this, uh, I mean, uh, how does this contribute to the efficiency of the harvester? So to answer these questions, we would uh, have to go into the figures of merit. So this is a plot, this uh, figure of, I mean, there are two domains, as you know, piezoelectric and electromagnetic. So each of these domains has this specific figure of merit. And uh, these are uh, both related to the power factor here. So higher the power factor, higher is the power output from the harvester. So how does this power factor depend on each of the figures of merit is what is shown on the left-hand side. So if you keep on increasing the figure of merit, of course, yeah, there is increase in the uh, overall power index, which increases the overall power. But if you look at uh, the farther and farther, if you, you are keeping on increasing the figure of merit in the piezoelectric and also in the electromagnetic, you will see that the power index is decreasing and this is resulting in lower power. But at the same time, on the right hand side, I show the plot for efficiency of the hybrid harvester. So if you look at this efficiency, as we keep increasing the piezoelectric figure of merit and the electromagnetic figure of merit, the efficiency keeps increasing. So these two are going in contrary. Um, but nevertheless, if you look at there is a particular value of figure of merit till that point, there is an increase in the power index. But uh, increasing both the figures of merit is found to be not always favorable, particularly for power. But uh, on the other hand, if you look at the efficiencies, so there is a particular range of uh, the, the power index within which when we try to maintain, we can get at least 50% of efficiency. Of course, we can get higher efficiency as well, but the power is going to be smaller. So these are some of the uh, analysis that one would uh, seek, particularly when we try to introduce hybrid energy harvester. And these dots are the ones uh, which correspond to the experimental harvesters, so four har hybrid harvesters are fabricated and two of them lie here and we get uh, at least 50%, 54% uh, efficiency when compared with the other two. So, uh, so the main thing here is that the hybrid energy harvesters do have uh, dependence on the figures of merit and we have to take care of them to increase both uh, the power and also the efficiency. And uh, towards the end, I would uh, discuss about the magnetic field uh, harvesting. Uh, partly here, uh, the source is the magnetic field around wires. So we have uh, uh, several uh, current carrying wires uh, in our home, particularly the appliances which draw high current like the electric, current, electric kettle or the hair dryer. Uh, they have a continuous magnetic field around the wires when the high current is drawn. And even the high voltage power lines have these magnetic fields uh, oscillating. And these are the potential source for harvesting energy. And so this uh, energy is uh, harvested uh, by using magnetoelectric composites. 
So ME composite is uh, having several layers of piezoelectric and magnet restrictive material. And also it consists of uh, magnetic end mass. So this uh, combination of all the magnetic uh, magnet restrictive material and the magnetic mass is what is going to respond to the magnetic fields around the current carrying wires. And uh, this is going to transfer the strains to the, to the piezoelectric element and uh, the energy is generated from that. So uh, these magnetomechanoelectric uh, coupled harvesters uh, have uh, the contribution from both magnet restrictive material and the magnet. So for example, uh, here we show the force on the harvester due to these two elements within the harvester. So here uh, we have the magnet restrictive coupling showing up uh, throughout the beam. And uh, there is the magnetic coupling showing up uh, right at the end of the beam because of the magnet placed. And uh, this magnetic magnet restrictive force is uh, the contribution not only from the material, but also the geometry. So we can uh, clearly distinct different material properties that go into the forcing. So be it uh, Young's modulus, the coupling constant, or uh, the geometrical effects like the width, thickness, and even the end mass are going to uh, affect the overall force in the magnet restrictive portion of the harvester. Here again, uh, the contrib uh, here again, we have shown different uh, magnet restrictive layers, and then we have a piezoelectric layer as a cross-sectional view. Uh, apart from this magnet restrictive force, we have uh, the end magnet also contributing to the force. Basically, an end magnet, uh, when it is placed in an external magnetic field, it is the, the internal field, the, or the, rather the field around the magnet is getting distorted. And this is what is causing the torque on the, from the magnet. And uh, the equivalent force on the beam is what is, uh, we are interested in. And uh, these two are the primary forces that, uh, that go into the ME composite. Apart from this, if we look at uh, the governing equations, they are in fact very much identical to what we had before for the piezoelectric vibration harvester. Uh, but it, with an exception that the forces now are not uh, the acceleration based uh, forces, but they are more uh, because of the end magnet and uh, the magnet restrictive beam. Uh, to validate this uh, contribution of the magnet restrictive beam, uh, we have fabricated uh, two harvesters wherein uh, the first version has the magnet restrictive beams while the second one has uh, non-magnetic beams or rather it's just a brass. So we will easy be, easily be able to find the difference uh, or rather the contribution of the magnet restrictive material to the overall power. And here you can see, particularly in this image, you will see that the because of the magnet restrictive beam, the flux from the magnet is partly helping in providing enough bias for the magnet restrictive beam. And uh, even the variation in the displacement with respect to frequency and resistance can be seen in uh, magnet restrictive beam versus brass, just the non-magnetic beam. And here you will see that the power in fact is almost 125% higher when compared with uh, non-magnetic beam. So this is a clear indication of uh, how we can enhance the power from the magnet restrictive, from ME composite basically, just by adding a magnet restrictive beam, uh, we'll be able to enhance the power output from uh, typical magnetic coupling harvesters. So one would perhaps ask, uh, is there any other way that we can further enhance the power output? Uh, yes, what we have found is that uh, by kind of distributing the magnetic mass along the beam, we can further enhance the power output from such harvesters. So the key thing here is that the frequency centric design. So uh, all these uh, magnetoelectric uh, harvesters have to be designed to a specific frequency because uh, the field uh, uh, at which the frequency at which the field oscillates is almost fixed. It is around 60 hertz in uh, in the US and uh, it's different in different parts of the world. But nevertheless, uh, because the frequency is fixed, we have a possibility to vary the 
mass but still maintain the same resonance frequency. So what we are doing in this is that uh, we are distributing the magnetic mass and uh, still maintain the same frequency of uh, 60 hertz and uh, try to see the enhancement in the power possible. So here uh, I show what we do. So we kind of uh, arrive, get the frequency distribution for different length ratios and mass ratios. So the length and mass ratios are simply the amount of mass put here versus uh, and, and uh, the location where the mass is kept. So as we sweep through these uh, variables, we find that there is a particular curve that we want to stick to, to get 60 Hertz resonance frequency. And uh, this is what is done here. To keep the same 60 Hertz resonance frequency, we have multiple alternatives. Like we can choose from different length ratio and mass ratios. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Typically, as you see that uh, by increasing mass ratio, the overall mass is going high and which is what is causing the power to go high. Excuse me. And simultaneously, uh, keep, we keep the frequency the same at 60 Hertz. So uh, this is a key technique that we have adopted recently to enhance the uh, five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, to enhance the power from these harvesters. So we went ahead and uh, try to design these harvesters and fabricate them. And uh, here is the response from the experimentally verified uh, harvesters. As you see for the for different levels of uh, magnetic fields, uh, we found that uh, the one which has distributed mass was almost 280% uh, higher in developing power compared with uh, conventional ME harvester. We have in fact uh, demonstrated a few uh, applications, mainly, for example, like charging up a supercapacitor of about one farad in about 150 minutes and using that power to power up a Bluetooth uh, sensor tag wherein which can transmit uh, several uh, environmental condition information uh, back to a mobile phone. And also we have uh, tried to find out the dependence of the current flow and the gap uh, at which the harvester is placed from the wire and uh, try to light up about 151 LEDs. And uh, so all these, demonstra all these uh, demonstrations uh, further reinforce the potential of the magnetic field energy harvesters. And uh, uh, yeah, with this, I would uh, like to conclude uh, by saying that uh, yeah, it has been uh, found that uh, in several studies have uh, the trend that in future wireless IoT devices are uh, um, predominantly dependent on energy harvesters. And uh, this certainly motivates us to kind of uh, optimize the performance of these harvesters, be it in the form of multi-layer, multi-steps. And uh, as I mentioned, the scaling analysis is another technique which, is, which can be extended to any other kind of uh, harvesters, not, not just this. Uh, so that is another technique in which we can make sure that the harvester designed is having uh, high performance. And other methods like hybrid harvesters are also a good option wherein we have to take care of the figures of merit in the individual domains. And uh, certainly the magnetic field harvesting is uh, uh, is going to have huge potential to transform the energies around the magnetic field, which are around the current carrying wires, which are otherwise going waste. And uh, all these improvements uh, certainly help in enhancing the power output from the magnetic and vibration energy harvesters, uh, which will be eventually used in IoT applications. With this, uh, I would like to end uh, by acknowledging NPMAS for funding projects at uh, Sense Indian Institute of Science and NSF and ONR at Penn State University and my colleagues. Thank you all. If you have any questions, I would like to answer. All right, thank you very much, Ram, for this great presentation. Excellent.
I know we have only three, four minutes. So if uh, anyone has questions, please feel free, free to ask or you could also type your questions in the chat. Brilliant. So Ram, I have, I have a quick question while, while folks are thinking. I think, I think one of the challenge in multi, uh, let's say multi energy harvesting is like they are all at different frequencies and different amplitudes, right? And it will be great actually to think about an harvester which can capture two or three different stimulations at the same time. Uh, like, like, like you presented some ideas. Um, but it's also very challenging to optimize the output from each of these excitations at the same time. Yeah. And there's yeah, is there a control that can be developed? So not so much on harvester side, but more on the control side that can try to do the maximum power transfer. Yeah, there are possibilities uh, because uh, these MPPTs basically look for maximum power point tracking. Uh, here, uh, based on the analysis, what we found is it is not just one load resistance at which we can get the maximum power. There is a set of resistors at which we can still get the power if there is a frequency shift particularly. So we we can make use of that uh, uh, benefit that inherently piezoelectric harvesters have that uh, even if there is a slight shift in the frequency, just by tuning the load resistance, we will be able to get the equally equal power output if we had at a different uh, resonance frequency. So that is one option, but it has a limited frequency band, but certainly that is a doable task uh, by controlling through the electronics, we will be able to get the power output. Any other questions from the folks? If not, then I have a quick question again, uh, Ram. So about the high frequency uh, vibration energy harvesting. Uh, I know everybody has been focused very much in literature on ultra low frequencies. Right. Is there a scope and because there are several places where we can get very high frequencies. Yeah, certainly uh, uh, the original focus has been mainly at low frequencies throughout this work, uh, but definitely the frequency dependence uh, is, a, is a good approach to particularly kind of separate out where exactly the frequency is going to play a role in the overall power generation. Uh, certainly because one other thing that I see is that the higher the frequency, higher is going to be the power. So directly, so definitely the power is going to be higher as we try to harvest higher frequencies. Uh, certainly like it's a good exercise to kind of uh, uh, see how does the frequency affect the power developed by these harvesters. Because you you hit upon MEMS design and so on, so I think it's easy to tune the operating point at higher frequency domains for for these smaller harvesters, right? So if there's advantage, then you take that advantage. All right. Yeah. Sure. Certainly, it'll be very helpful for MEMS scale. Yeah. Great. Uh, any last minute comments or questions from anyone in the audience? If not, then thanks so much everyone for attending this talk and thank you Ram for giving this great presentation. Very, very exciting talk. And, and thanks very much everyone for joining in. So Sadie will announce and post the next PAC webinar for next month on our website and also on the PAC fellowship website. So I hope all of you will be able to join next uh, month. Uh, until then, thanks so much and please email us if you need any information from us. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Have a good everybody. day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.